Good morning again. Good morning. It's so good to see you, and we pray God's blessings upon you this morning as we come to worship our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. The grace of our Lord and Savior be with you. Also with you. you. Amen. Let us begin our time together by standing and singing page, from page 351, Pass Me Not, O Gentle Savior. Pass me not, O gentle Savior, hear my humble cry. While on earth does thou art calling, do not pass me by. Say Amen. 
Let us also remember uh, our wine who's traveling this weekend. We ask that you pray for him as he and his wife takes the road. Shall we bow our heads? Eternal and most merciful God, one who is more in love with us than we are with him. We come, Father, bowed before your throne of grace. We come, Lord, just giving you thanks for another day's journey. We come, Lord, realizing that it was you that woke us up this morning. That it was you, Lord, that allowed us to come here to this, your house of worship. And we express, Lord, our gratitude. We ask that you would just come in the midst right now. We ask, God, that you would send your Holy Spirit upon us all. Put us all on one accord because, Lord, we know that when we are on one accord, it is then that you can use us and make us your church. We remember the day of Pentecost, Lord. Your spirit fell upon them when the scripture says, when they were on one accord. Come within our hearts and minds. Remove us and replace it with you. That we might dwell together here this day. That we might worship you, Lord, in a way that will be fitting in your sight. That the things that are said, the things that are done, the songs that are sung, and the scriptures that are read, Lord, might fill us. Letting us know, Father, that you still love us and that your grace and your mercy still covers us. We've called so many by name this morning. And Lord, we know that you know all about it. We pray, oh God, that you would go into those places, that you would touch those that, that we are concerned about, we, that you would touch those, Lord, that who might not even know your name. Because, Father, we know that you gave us yourself for the whole world. And so, Father, we pray for those that are in need this morning. Churched and unchurched, Lord, we pray for them all. We pray for the situation that the world has found itself in today, Lord. We especially pray for those that are in Ukraine and Russia. We ask, O oh God, that you send your spirit of peace. That you would help them, Lord, to beat their, their spears into plowshares, that they might study war no more. We thank you, O oh God, just for hearing us this morning. For in hearing God, we know that you will also answer. We come just asking you to be with us, that we might be your church. And that we might worship you in spirit and in truth. For this is our prayer. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. 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 And amen. Amen. We have our scripture lesson at this time. Good morning, all. The Lord be with you. This, this gospel lesson this morning is my sermon, so let us stand as we read the gospel of Luke, chapter 15, verses 1 to 3, and then verses 11 to 32. The gospel of Luke, 15, chapter Verse 1 to 3, and then verse 11 to 32. Jesus told them these parables in response to the grumbling of the Pharisees and scribes who were upset that Jesus was eating with tax collectors and sinners. Jesus' first two parables, the lost sheep and the lost coin, offer a mild rebuke to the Pharisees and the scribes by reminding them of heaven's joy over the repentance of the sinner. Then Jesus tells the story of the prodigal son to set up a more severe rebuke when he concludes with the story of the elder son. 
Verse 1. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathered around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Then Jesus told them this parable. Verse 11. Jesus continued, There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pies that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am, starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father said, saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the oldest son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your order. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, who has squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, you kill the fatty calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me, and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad, because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. The word of God for the people of God. Thank you, God. Let the church say amen. Let the church say amen. God has spoken. Let the church say amen. Let the church say Most of all, thank you for loving us just as we are. Amen. We humble ourselves before you as we await to hear a much needed word from you. Yes, Amen. Amen. The prodigal son parable is a favorite among parishioners and preachers alike. The focal point of this parable is the father's forgiveness. This parable reassures us that no matter how we sin, 
God will eagerly welcome us back home. To start off this parable, the young son demands his inheritance from his father. Typically, sons receive their inheritance on the death of their father. So the younger son's request is rather insulting and disrespectful. Tantamount to saying to his father, drop dead. I had a couple of titles for this particular sermon. The first one was, what about me, dad? This one, you are dead to me. You are dead to me. That's the most stern rebuke. Give me my inheritance so that I can leave this miserable place. Not the young son's exact words, but when he requested his inheritance while his father was yet still alive, it was very offensive, disrespectful, and brought shame to the entire family. To hear one of your children, whether directly or indirectly, speak such, like, speak such language to you as a parent could be heartbreaking and devastating. In traditional Middle Eastern culture, to ask for the inheritance while the father is still in good health would be to say that the son is anxious for his father to die. We could assume that the father came upon some hardship of having to divide up tangible property and the working assets of the family business prematurely. It was a request that should have, not, should have never been made and one that no Middle Eastern father would have agreed to. The son's early request for his inheritance severs the bond between the son and his family and drives them apart even further when he wastes all of his inheritance. The very definition of prodigal literally means wasteful, wastefully extravagant. How many of you have ever said in your young years, of course, I can't wait until I grow up? Amen. I can't wait to have my own car, have my own place, have my own money so I can do whatever I want, whenever I want. No. Huh? <laughs> it sounded like we all wanted to grow up just a little bit fast, huh? Like the young son. We want to have and experience the finer things in life. And as you should, absolutely nothing wrong with living your best life. But the son in this parable went about it completely wrong. He felt stuck in that village of farmers, ranchers, and gardeners. There was a whole other world out there just waiting to be explored. But he wanted out. Side note here, while splitting up the inheritance, it is the elder son that gets the bigger share. According to Deuteronomy 21 and 17, it specifies that the first son is to be given a double portion of the inheritance. So a father's property is to be divided by the number of sons plus one. If there are two sons in this particular case, the property is to be divided into three portions, two of which, 67%, goes to the elder son, and the third is 33%. Not long, verse 13, not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. It wasn't enough to just go to the next town. He departed for this distant country as far as he could possibly go from his father's influence. The son was lost, lost in his own way of thinking and lost from his father's protection and guidance, just as we as Christians have come. We get lost in our own way of thinking. We get lost when we want to get somewhere and we go without the guidance of Almighty Father. Amen. He wasn't thinking of tomorrow. He wanted to live his best life doing what he wanted, when he wanted, answering to no one. No doubt it was fun while it lasted. The younger son is alive and well today. We all want freedom. We want to do what we want to do when we want to do it. We chafe at accountability and resent supervision. We imagine that we can make it big if only given the chance. If only I could get away from home. If only I had a new car. If only I could get a better job. If only I didn't have the responsibility of a family. If only I won the lottery. If only I could get rid of my student debt. 
the bone. Verse 14, after he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country. He began to be in need. The young son's reckless spending habits were certainly not to blame for the famine, but without funds to buy a morsel of bread, he was affected by it nonetheless. Verse 15, the young son hired himself unto a citizen as a pig farmer. Driven by hunger and in need, the son accepted work that was unacceptable and offensive to any righteous Jewish person because swine was considered unclean under the law. Verse 17 is the aha moment for the young man. He realizes that he screwed up royally. <laughs> Scripture says he came to his senses. King James Version says he came to himself. Man, I really messed up. How did I go from having it all to having absolutely nothing? I'm down here with these pigs and I'm not even allowed to eat what they're eating. Being a menial servant to a pig for me, he is hungry. He knows that contrast between the situation and that all of his, ser that of his father's servants who have plenty to eat. It dawns on him that he could improve the situation considerably if he could persuade his father to hire him as a hired hand. Know how far he has fallen. Once a fully fledged member of his family, he now covets the status of a servant who once was subject to his orders. He realizes now that he needs to make a move. So he's decided, I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven, against heaven and you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. While we might think of a slave as a lord, as lord than a hired hand, Stalin's believed that a slave in that context had a closer relationship to the family than a hired hand, who was more part of the family and often worked under the direct supervision of the master. The hired hand is employed as needed and can be let go far more casually. In his prepared speech to his father, the son showed his complete sense of unworthiness and an honest confession of sin. He would not even ask to be treated as a son, but as a hired servant. He has come to the realization that in fact, he's made a huge mistake and would like to attempt to make it right. But what will his father say? Will he scold him and embarrass him in front of the community for abandoning, abandoning his family? Take him back, but rub his face in it every once in a while. The father never went looking for him, but he anxiously awaited his son's arrival. The father in this parable is like our merciful father. He waits for our return to him. As his children, we wandered off into that distant country, lost and out of touch with the father. Once we realized we're lost, out of resources, and our so-called friends left us, then we'll have that life of woman. Hopefully sooner than later, we'll come to repent. This is the point at which a ruined life can be restored. It is a moment when a prodigal son, or an alcoholic, or a drug addict, or a sinner, can suddenly admit this isn't working. I need to change. I can't do it on my own. I need to ask for help. At that point, restoration becomes possible. Not certain or guaranteed, but possible. And through Christ, all things are possible. But the son was grown, right? He left. He abandoned the family. The family business, his community, all for a piece of the good life. Or so he pursued. But with nothing left to his name, the son had no choice but to return home and face the consequences of his actions. Dr. Miles Monroe, God rest his soul, put it like this. The son wanted to live off a bucket of water. A bucket of water from a well that never ran dry. He went out sharing with everyone, and now he has run dry. And there he was, coming down that road. Dirty clothes, his head hung low, a diminished spirit, and an empty belly. Broken, humiliated and former shell of himself and not feeling worthy of being called the son. When you become broken, it's something about a breaking that gets you to change your mindset. 
something about a breaking that says, yes, I think I need to get it right now. Something about a breaking that gets your spirit to move and realize, God, I know I can't do it without you now. God, if I can just press forth. God, if I need, God, I need you right now. This isn't a battle that I can fight alone. God, I know I need you right now. His father saw him. Jesus sees us. His father saw him, ran to him, kissed him, and embraced him. Can we embrace someone that has wronged us? Huh? Can we embrace someone? You cussed me out just the other day. I don't think I would talk about that. You took something from me years ago, 10, 10 20 years ago. I still don't like it. I'm, but we want people to forgive us for our transgressions, for things that we've done, but we're not as forgiving as others. Christ is not like that, and He doesn't even touch that. We are to forgive just as we are to be forgiven. Amen? Amen. Halfway through His apology to His Father, the Father interrupts Him quick, bring the best robe and put it on Him. Put a ring on His finger and sandals on His feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was this son of mine was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. Not just any robe, but the best robe and a ring on his finger. Back in the days of Abraham, the fathers would give rings to their children. Those rings meant you had authority and you had access. And that you are representation of that family. The robe, ring, and shoes convey dignity in the same way that a pinstripe suit on my suit today. <laughs> that is so tired of you. They denote status. They signify that the father is returning this young man to the family. Servants don't wear robes, rings, and shoes, but instead wear clothing that marks them as servants. The robe, ring, and shoes mark this young man as a family sire, the father's son. Just because you've been through the muck and mud doesn't mean that's where you're supposed to stay and be. Put on that robe, put on that ring, put on the sandals of God's own He's welcoming you back to the home. You're welcome back. That's for the fatted calf, the fatted calf. Meat is not a part of their daily diet, but it is reserved for a special occasion. When meat is required, a family usually slaughters a sheep or goat because a small animal represents a lesser investment than a calf and can be consumed more easily within the family circle. They reserve the fat calf, the, the it didn't say a, but it said the, the fat calf for greater celebrations because its larger size means neighbors, needs neighbors, perhaps the whole village, to help consume it. In slaughtering the fatted calf, the father involves the community, sends them a message that he has restored his son to sonship, and therefore the community, and therefore to community membership as well. When the father embraced him and showed his love, he didn't beat him down, he didn't say, why did you leave? Why did you take all that money? He grabbed him and pulled him. Brace and say, son, welcome back. You might look a little dirty. You might smell a little funny right now, but welcome back home, son. Again, can we do that for someone that is wrong? Can we do that for our own child, even though they might have said, I despise you, I hate you? Hmm. Back home now, we're partying. The eldest son comes into play. He's working the fields all day, but he hears something. He hears all the music, all the singing, and all the commotion going back in the house. A servant tells him that his brother returns and follow through a celebration. Big brother is big mad right now. He's back. The way he disrespected the family, disrespected our father, left us to do only God knows what. The heck with him. Could have stayed gone for all I care. I'm staying out of here. I'm not entertaining his company. The other son was not happy that his brother was so joyfully received. 
He complained and felt like it was an insult to his own obedience and faithfulness. The father sees that his elder son isn't there celebrating. His father pleaded with him. This is a heartbreaking moment. They both sons under the same roof again. And now finds the elder son still outside. Unwilling to enter the house or take part of the celebration. The father was celebrating the end of his family's brokenness. But now finds it broken in another place. Now the elder son filled with anger and frustration. Takes it out on his father very disrespectfully. I might add. He yells, verse 29, look. All these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, he didn't call him brother, he said, this son of yours, who has squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, you kill the fatty cat for him. A respectful address would be father rather than look. In today's society, it might cost you Chocolate crushers, please. <laughs> <laughs> this elder son finally showed the bitterness that he was harboring all this time. The elder son finally showed his bitterness to his father, but only after it's done his damage in his heart for over many years. To hold on to that such a for such a long time was not good for his mental state. Not or not, nor maintaining the relationship with his father. In more ways than one, we felt like this at some point in our lives. You work hard, toil day and night, work overtime, extra days even. You try to give it your all when no one else does. You stay the course and remain faithful even when no one else does. And then someone else gets the glory, gets the recognition when they've been slacking while you've been outside trying to make a name for yourself. Still trying to do what's right. Any of that sounds familiar? I'm glad that God, our merciful and righteous Father, who supplies grace over grace, isn't like Big Brother here. I'm so glad that He is the Father in this parable, loving even when we didn't want to deal with Him, compassionate even when we felt fear and battered and wanted it our way. Our decisions today can affect our tomorrow. But we must realize that we simply can't do it without the full authority of God. As much as we know now, we can't operate outside of God's grace. Verse 31, my son, the father said, you are always with me and everything that I have is yours. But we have to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. The elder son did not use the word father. To address his father, but his father uses the Greek word technon, which means my child, an even more endearing term. In his callous disregard for his brother and his refusal to enter the house, the elder brother sets himself apart, not only from his younger brother, but also from his father. His actions, his actions suggest to the community that he has divorced himself from the family and act every bit as shocking as that of the younger son. Now the father who extended grace to the younger son extends grace to his elder son as well. The father reassures the elder son that the younger son's presence affects neither the father's affection for the elder son nor the elder son's inheritance. Both are secure and always happy. This is good news for the elder sons among us. It is often easier to love a desolate younger brother than a prideful, judgmental older brother. But the father's love is broad enough to encompass both sons. Jesus gave this parable in response to complaints to Pharisees and scribes who complained that Jesus welcomed sinners and ain't with them. They need to hear that their inheritance is not diminished by God's love for sinners. They also need to hear that they have no right to draw boundaries that would exclude others from God's presence. God is still waiting for our return. With arms wide open, God wants us to come back home. He's waiting. Like the Father in this parable, will you wait for your son's return? Will you be just as loving and compassionate 
God extends this courtesy to us. But if we're, if, if we're to imitate Jesus, can we adopt such behavior? Don't be like Big Brother with a hardened heart. Like Jesus, have a renewing, restorative love for what was dead is alive and what was lost is now found. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Let us stand and sing 359, Alas, and did my Savior do. 359.
make mistakes and laugh at ourselves. Oh, yeah. Amen. Yeah. 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 You can't laugh at yourself and there's something wrong with you. <laughs> but we thank God for you this morning. Amen. Glad that you're here and we pray that God has touched and blessed you in some way. Uh, I think we have an announcement about the the uh, Easter lilies. Yes, I'm a little disappointed. The Easter lilies went up to 7:25, and I am collecting for those who do have it today because Miss Elizabeth is out of town. If you can, please. Thank you, Miss Brown. See, Miss Brown, uh, concerning the Easter lilies, as you said, it went up just a little bit, uh, and she needs to collect so we can get the uh, lilies ordered. Uh, also, want to remind everyone about the Lenten Bible study. We will be moving to Wednesday night just this one time. We're going to move to Wednesday night at 6 o'clock because all of us know the bridge run is next Saturday, the 2nd. And uh, we know what happens to downtown Charleston when the bridge run takes place. So uh, we'll be meeting Wednesday night at 6 o'clock. Amen? Amen. 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 Are there any other announcements? Well, seeing none, let us stand in Jesus' midst. Now may the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ, the sweet communion of his Holy Spirit, and the love of God the Father Almighty, rest, rule, and abide with us now henceforth and forevermore. Amen. 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 Go in peace and may the peace of God go with you. Amen. Amen.